everybody. I'm Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association in New York. And we have a somewhat unusual, um, but I think uh, pivotal subject this week. Uh, Thomas Clark, here present uh, by Zoom from Scotland, uh, with that magnificent piece of Scottish municipal architecture hovering in the background, um, reinforces the other subject, because it does look like a city centre in Ukraine, of Soviet era, um, which a lot of British municipal architecture did, especially Scotland. And he has translated Animal Farm, George Orwell's book, into Scots. And this has sort of multiple resonances because, first of all, Animal Farm is always relevant in the current state of politics where people, what I say three times must be true on the front benches of uh, the Duma or Congress or the Houses of Commons. Uh, the capacity of politicians to lie and state the opposite of what is obvious and persuade people that what they're saying is true is uh, never going to go out of fashion. I have reread Animal Farm in the original English several times recently, and I read it recently in this Scots translation. So the second question is, why is it being translated into Scots? And then a week or so ago, I discovered that the first I re recalled the first introduction to Animal Farm by George Orwell was to the Ukrainian edition, which if you can't get more relevant than that, I don't know. And this was so obnoxious to the Russian, big Russian brothers in Berlin that they actually persuaded the American occupying authorities to help them ransack the printers and try to confiscate the remaining copies. But it still went out there and recently a first edition of it was uh, given to the daughter of the translator, I believe it was. So it's, it's, it's filled with significance. Why would you want to translate it into Ukrainian, you ask? Well, I think Animal Farm bears translation into any language. But then we get back to the particular case of Thomas, who's going to explain to us why he thinks, uh, for all of its faults and others, most Scots speak better English than the English, in fact, <laughs> in, the, in the traditional sense. So he, <clears throat> why translate Animal Farm into Scots? Uh, independence is looming. Do the Scots need a new language, uh, or not a new language, to revive the language? Because you remember the old famous dictum was that a country was, uh, was a, a language with a flag <laughs> and a navy. <laughs> well, Scotland's got its language, it's got a flag, it's probably working on the navy. <laughs> Watch out and hold it <laughs> those nuclear submarines. <laughs> Thomas, please explain why and how. Sure. Well, I'll start off by reading a little bit from Animal Farm, and then I'll talk a wee bit about why it's not important that we have Animal Farm available. In so could you show us the cover of the book so people know what to get? Here we go. Animal this Farm. is the hardcover illustrated. So I'm going to read you a wee bit for you. to start. I'm going to read you chapter one, Animal Farm. Mr. Jones, on the manor firm, had snack at the hen houses for the nicht, but it was our food to mind to shut the potholes. With the rim of licht frae his lantern dancing from side to side, he swavered across the yard, drew himself a last glass of beer frae the barrel in the scullery, and stood her up to bed, where Mrs. Jones was already snoring. As soon as the licht in the bedroom went out, there was a rousting and a fluttering all through the steepings of the firm. Word had got run throughout the day that old Major, the prize middle light boar, had had an uncle dream the next before and wanted to let lick there to the other animals. It had been agreed that they should all meet in the muckle barn as soon as Mr Jones was safe and sicker out the road. Old Major, it was like his called Dom, though the name he'd been exhibited on that was Willingdon Beauty, was that real thought on the firm that Obadie was read to loss an hour's sleep just to hear what he had to say. At the end, end of the firm, the, the end of the muckle berm, on a kind of heased platform, Major was already stanced under a lantern that hung to a box. He was 12 years old and had been getting muckle booking this past wee while. But he was still a stately looking pig with a wife's and benevolent appearance, in spite of the fact that his tusks had never been cut. A four lang, the other animals started to arrive and get themselves cosy in their cindery lights. First came the three dogs. Bluebell, Jessie and Pincher, and then the pigs, we carried, carried down in the stray 
right in front of the platform. The hens roosted themselves on the windy cells. The doos flutter up to the box. The sheep and coos lay down a hint of pigs and stared at the chaw of the cud. The three care horses, boxer and clover, came in together, donned their unhealthy slow and set them down their bursy, bossy hoofs, with great tent for fear that some wee animal should be happy in the stirrer. Clover was a stout motherly mare coming up in the middle of her years, but his figure had never quite mended through the birth of her fowl. Boxer was an undemous beast, nearly as eighteen horns high, and as strong as only two other horses put together. A white streak running down his nerve, mack at him like a wee bit dippy. And in all truth, he wasn't exactly the sharpest you'd ever meet, but he was respected by all for his evenliness of character and by order. Thomas, character. I think this is where we have to revert to English. We've already had several questioners asking for translations. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> is this decodable? <laughs> and um, <laughs> actually, it's about as decodable as Ukrainian and Russian, I suspect. And you listen and you you get the essences. From the north of England, we know that the GH was pronounced until quite recently. In you the, all those dead sounds in English were, were actually are actually still pronounced. So it's the neck. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. the night. Um and similarly, if you're if you're attuned to this and if you're from the north of England, it is no great stretch to follow. Uh, I had yeah. no difficulty there. A few words. Uh, one of the ones that struck me was the word for comrade. Oh, is it? Yes, yes. Did you, is that a nonce word you invoted for the occasion or was it something like Hugh McDermott and the Scottish Communist used? No, no, fear literally means friend or it, it has a more brotherly connotations than friend. I thought that comrade was going to be out of place in a Scots language translation of. I, what I wasn't sure whether this was a neologism for you or whether it had been used before, you know. Yeah. Because no, no, it's I. I mean, for for the benefit of those who are not too close to Scotland, um, Scotland and the Scottish miners in particular gave birth to both the British Labour Party and the British Communist Party, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Hugh McDermott, the Scots nationalist communist, was famous because he did an ode to Lenin, composed <laughs> fresh <laughs> in broad Scots, <laughs> which uh, well, you can still find in anthologies and online. <laughs> and he went so. to his deathbed as a, a nationalist and a, a Scots nationalist and a communist. So we get back to why, uh, why did you find this uh, necessary? Because you mentioned, you know, in, impending the possibility of independence. Well, the first thing I'd say is that I wouldn't want to associate the Scots language too closely with independence. There are plenty of supporters of independence who aren't keen on the Scots language, and there are plenty of speakers of Scots language who are not supporters of independence. So although the battle lines have been drawn up that way, that's not quite as clear cut as all that. But the reason, the main reason that I thought that we needed a Scots language animal farm and Jesus, Scots Scots language, everything, really, but animal farm in particular, is that English has become the, the language of cliché and commerce, and it's the hegemony of English in Scotland has been, well, it's been dreadful in many ways, it's been dreadful culturally for us, it's been dreadful artistically for us. English has become worn out everywhere, I think, but in Scotland in particular, and what we need to do now next is to replenish and renew English, or if it is a bust gig, as it might be, to replace it entirely with something else. If we're going to replace it with something else, then Scott seems to me the obvious thing. And I think it's just it's funny you should mention Hugh McDermott there, because obviously you probably know yourself, George Orwell was not a fan of Hugh McDermott at all. The, couldn't stand the man. And to be fair, most Scots shared that opinion, couldn't stand the man, loved the poetry, but the man himself, not so popular. And one of the, the one of the things that I wanted to work through, along with Orwell, through translating Animal Farm, was his evolving ideas about Scotland, because as with everything else in politics, Orwell was prescient about Scottish culture and Scottish independence. Orwell had ideas about Scotland. He really, he was a man, he had some prejudices like anybody at his time. And he 
you don't have to look far in his writing to find some pretty sneasty, as we would say in Scots, unpleasant, nasty things that he thought and said about Scotland and Scottish culture. And But he did change his mind over the course of his lifetime. I mean, famously, obviously, he wrote 1984 during the last three years of his life while he was living here in Scotland. And one of the things that he seemed to have become deeply interested in while he was living here in Scotland was the Gaelic language and the native languages of Scotland. So I thought, bearing in mind that Orville was hugely interested in translation anyway, like you say, he made sure that Animal Farm was available in Ukrainian. He gave away the translation rights to Animal Farm and to most of his books for a song, just to make sure that these books were being read where it was most important that they were being read, whether that was in Ukraine or Burma or somewhere else. I think now Orwell would have thought that Scotland was one of the places there is important animal farm was being read. And that's why we need a Scots language animal farm. Uh, Orwell was a giant who had admired in many ways, but like all idols, he had feet of clay. And one of them was he was a southern English gentleman, an old Etonian. And what he knew yes. about the rest of the country could be written on the side of his uh, one of his infamous roll ups. <laughs> If, 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 if he got to it and uh, he had a lot of the prejudices of the time um you know he went to liverpool and wigan and places and god knows what he made but as you point out in your book he actually spent many of the last years of his life uh after the second world war in the isle of dura in in, in the hebrides almost died there in fact his boat capsized mm -hmm. um, so he he, he he i presume this is when he we date his um his road to Damascus or road to Dundee or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> the, main I think so. the, the finer I sides think. of Scotland. But he was also, I mean, he he was a big he was a British imperial policeman who was a huge opponent of British imperialism in India mm -hmm. and a supporter of Indian, Indian independence. And I think this is the parts that you're alluding to. He was also very um he was very diffident about the actual leaders of independence in India. Mm -hmm. He did. He, he was a bit scathing about Gandhi, I think, uh, several yes. times. He produced some. He, he did not like many people today go whoring after strange gods and decide that G Gandhi must be wonderful because he's representing a course I associate with. He was. Mm -hmm. He tempered this <laughs> in a very yeah. strong way. Uh, Presumably, his support for Scottish independence would have drawn up right on Hugh McDermott. <laughs> well, it's funny you should mention Empire, because apparently one of the many reasons that Orwell had developed his prejudice against Scots was because of the Scottish people he worked with while he was in Burma, while he was an, an imperial officer himself. And I don't know what they did to offend him, but he certainly seemed to have taken against the Scots big time. Well, he was away working and certainly saw the Scots as being part of the empire and part of the empirical project rather than victims of it at that stage. So, so yeah, but you're, you're absolutely right. I think Orwell had a, well, he, he was a man of, he was a man of, he was a man like uh, Winston Smith who was able to think two things at once and try and find ways of reconciling those two contradictory beliefs. And when it came to victimhood, in particular, he seemed to struggle to reconcile his queasy admiration for people who are victims or oppressed, to reconcile that with his, if not quite disgust, certain, certainly contempt or something close to it for people who allowed themselves to become victims. And I think living in Scotland, clearly living in Scotland is the thing that, like you say, he, had, he was ignorant of things outside of southern England and when he came to Wigan when he came to Liverpool finally when he came to Jura he gained direct experience of things that he'd just been speculating about before and I've no doubt whatsoever that his direct experience of Scotland was the turning point for his views on Scottish independence although having said that I should emphasize I don't think he was ever I don't think he ever came around to the idea that Scottish independence would be a good thing for the United Kingdom like many English people he was probably in favour of the idea of independence for Scotland, whilst unhappy about the idea of Scotland leaving the United Kingdom. 
Yeah, where will we get our malt whiskey from? It's a very important question. <laughs> it's where you get your malt whiskey from. It's where the, they get their politicians from. It's where they got so many of their ideas from. There's a lot that the United Kingdom owes to Scotland, and even the most blinkered Englishman recognises that in the general run of things. Uh, the member Ronald Bryn, uh, wasn't Animal Farm a satire on the communist socialist system, like a modest proposal was about capitalism? Mm -hmm. He also wants to know, do we all get a PhD for this webcast? Ronald, you send me a check for $1,000. I will send you a genuine, asserted Trump University PhD. But that's a separate <laughs> issue, a separate commercial transaction. Do, do you want to answer this? Because it's a very common, in fact, I wrote a book on this, about different perceptions of all, well, from the American and the British mm -hmm. points of view, where the, the cultural prejudices all pile on. Uh, mm -hmm. Over to you, to your press conference. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, obviously, Animal Farm is a, is a direct allegory of Soviet Russia, Soviet Russia, as it was at the time of Orwell's writing it. Um, what I think is more important than that isn't so much that it was a direct allegory, is that it's an allegory which actually has survived the dissolution of the Soviet, of the Soviet Union, and that what Animal Farm has to say to us now isn't contingent at all upon us living during a time or knowing anything about Lenin or Trotsky or any of the, the people that Orwell himself was writing about. Animal Farm survives. What Animal Farm is about, really principally, is the, the weaponization of language, the weaponization of language as it was in the Soviet Union of the time. And the weaponization of language now is not hugely different from that of the 30s or 40s or 20s. Well, I mean, they certainly perfected the technology. It was emulated by the Nazis. And um, we are now, um, now it's been perfected. Uh, as the, I think it was the bathroom quip said, uh, 1984 was meant as a warning, not as a textbook. <laughs> uh, similarly for Animal Farm as well, as, as a parable. Um, it, it's, uh, it's particular because he was very keen. It, it was, it was, the sort of Leninist system, the centralized control that he objected to. Uh, Orwell started off as an anarchist. Uh, not many Americans know that one of his last writings, he said, I was and remain a socialist. I'm a member of the British Labour Party and I support the Labour government in their efforts. So mm -hmm. up yours, the neoliberals who, who, who come to Orwell, <laughs> I suppose. It's, um, but he, he wanted a far more humane bit. But he had all his class prejudice as well, didn't he? Um, yeah. Ronald Brynn has just applied for his PhD and the check is in the mail, he says. <laughs> <laughs> well, Simon Lux says, it feels that Scots one T, Simon, you fail. You're <laughs> it, it feels that Scots is a relic of the past or is used as shorthand for Scottishness. Is, it, is using it consistent with a forward-looking independent vision for Scotland? Aye, it's over to you. <laughs> That's a really interesting question, and I think that's one of the reasons why there isn't such a clear-cut divide between Scot <clears throat> Scots language activism and pro-independence activism, because there is a very clear way in which you can interpret the, the whatever you want to call it, the renaissance of Scots as being backward-looking. You could say that it's a form of cultural conservatism, because what we are trying to rebuild is a Scots which essentially has been dying out for a hundred years. We are in a lot of ways harking back to golden ages of yore, just like with the <laughs> just like the, the, the guys in Animal Farm are themselves. We are essentially harking back to golden days of yore and trying to recreate them. So yeah, there, there definitely is a, an, an obvious conservative strain to the idea of the Scots language. For whatever reason, that's not how it's reported in the media here. That's not how the battle line's been drawn up here. The idea, I think, what it principally boils down to, actually, is that the idea of having your own language and your own culture is seen here to be, to some extent, something that we or should be aspired to, something that our European cousins and brethren have. Multilingualism is obviously a lot more normal in mainland Europe than it is here in Scotland. And I think the idea of having one's own language having one's own culture, having one's own multiple languages is a way of 
forging the relationship with Europe that I think is behind a lot of Scottish nationalism, or at least is a key aspect of Scottish nationalism. But it's about finding a place for ourselves in the world. One thing you will hear a lot of um, from detractors of Scots is the idea that Scots excludes people from other countries, the use of Scots excludes non-Scots speakers, excludes people from mainland Europe. And it's a very short-sighted idea to me because whenever I meet a Basque speaker or a Catalan speaker or a speaker of a minority language from another country in Europe, they of course immediately identify with Scots, understand the struggle, understand what we're doing and why it matters. It's a connection between us and Europe, not something that divides us. It's a connection between us and other multilingual speakers all over the world, not something that separates us. So that's why I think that's where the progressive aspect of the Scots language um, project comes in. And I think that's principally what ties it to independence and perhaps it, yeah, ties it to progressive ideas in a way that... This idea of the minority is... The cultural conservatism of the project. Yeah, it's very potent. I remember being in a bar in Air um, during a union conference and <laughs> I was being accosted by a, a, a nine foot Scot whose moustache went up into his nostrils and continued <laughs> all the way down his chest. And he said, see you, you're English. And my mate said to me, he's not English, he's from Liverpool. Ah, you know, <laughs> English, give him a drink, give him a drink. <laughs> and it's the idea of being on the outside that attracts people. We're all on the outside together. You've probably seen numerous satirical or semi-satirical maps of a proposed independent Scotland where the line is drawn south of Liverpool, south of Newcastle, south of the north of England, who certainly in a lot of ways are seen as having culturally more in common with Scotland than with the south of England. They're nice Scots, but they're nice about it. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but, um, are there serious attempts to teach Scots as, uh, as uh, uh, in the schools? Uh, I mean, I wondered how much was it precipitated by the Northern Ireland agreements where Ulster Scots was written as part of the agreements and uh, it looked a bit of a stretch at the time. I've seen some of the documents in it and they're legible, but it's a very, min it's a very minority pursuit. And I think it was, well, if you're going to give the... Catholic Scot, if you're going to give the Catholic Irish uh, the Gaelic, then you better give us our language as well, up yours. Yeah, well, Scots in Scotland obviously is inextricably tied to the politics of the country, and not, but not anywhere near so much as Ulster Scots is to the politics of Northern Ireland. And I don't think there is such a direct connection in terms of the, the renaissance of interest in Scots here. I don't think it has too much to do with the Ulster Scots in Northern Ireland, I think really, well, in the last 10 years, obviously, it has been the independence referendum of 2014, when there was a renewed interest in Scots culture generally. That's what's happened in the last 10 years. The 10 years previous to that, I think what you're looking at is the, is the Scots Parliament re, being reinstituted, and suddenly Scotland had some powers of its own in order to protect and to promulgate its own culture. So in the last 20 years, there's been a wee bit more in terms of government support for Scots, a wee bit more in terms of government support for Scots publishing, and a wee bit more in terms of government support for education in Scots. For Your own language. book has a credit to the Scottish government for helping publication. Well, I should say, and I, sh I should make clear that it's not simply the Scottish National Party, as are currently the Scottish government, it has been all of the Scottish governments up until now have done about the same for Scots. And certainly when Scots, when this all started 20 years ago, you'd be talking about a Labour administration rather than a Scottish National Party administration. And it's also notable that support for Gaelic, which is strong in this country, was formalised by not the Scottish National Party, but by the, the Labour Party. So I've lost, where am I going to keep this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think in the last 20 years, there's been a gradual change this year there is talk that there's going to be a Scots language bill go through the Scottish Parliament, which those of us who speak Scots really hope is going to result in strong formalised support for Scots. 
right now what we have in Scotland is a situation where Scots is very much contingent, or this is sport and Scots and promotion Scots are very much contingent on the goodwill of individuals. What we need now is for it to be something that's formalised and built in to our education system, our broadcasting, our publishing systems. But this leads to sort of dangers as we've seen, like the uh, Ukrainian attempts to promote Ukrainian uh, being presented by Moscow as an attempt to suppress Russian suppress Russian speakers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and I mean, do, w- w- what do you envisage in the bill that will uh, head this off at the past? Well, we do get that. Obviously, we get the idea, and we get the idea that promotion. Scots is somehow antithetical to promoting English or for that matter Gaelic. Well, in Scotland, English hasn't gone away. It doesn't matter what happens, it doesn't matter what the Scottish government does or any other body does, English is here to stay and it will be the Langua Franca of Scotland going forward. It will be a valuable tool to everybody who lives and works in Scotland. It's not, we're not going to be able to overthrow English in this country. It's not, it's, it's, it's here to stay. All we'll be doing is trying to get Scots some kind of parity with English to maintain Scots alongside English. There's no, no sensible person in Scotland who proposes replacing English with Scots. There's no sensible person. Quite apart from anything else, Scots isn't spoken in the whole of Scotland. In the Highlands and in the Hebrides, Gaelic was, and to the extent that it, it still is, the, the, lang- the alternative language to English. There is very little Scots spoken in these parts of Scotland, and Scots has got no, no basis for becoming a purely national language the way that English are, a broadly national language the way English is. And here's one that you can answer if you like. Uh, Ronald Bryn, is there any Scots hip, hip-hop? Isn't there that actually is. For a cultural future? Yeah. Yep, there, 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 uh, there is such a thing as Scots hip hop. There is such a thing as Scots rap. There's a chap called Solar Eye, Dave Hook, who, and I advise you to look him up on YouTube. He's excellent. He does Scots language hip hop, and it's it's kind of pigeon Scots. It's half and half Scots and English, but it is recognisably Scots. And things are moving in that direction. Generally, we've got things in Scots that we wouldn't have expected to see in Scots 20 years ago. We have the beginnings of a Scots publishing industry, which had almost died a death 20 years ago. We had to give Scots sci-fi. That was something that didn't exist not so long ago. I've read them all. There's some lot of revolutionary content in them as well. Indeed, indeed. Um, Matthew Fitz, Button Benagogo, which is 20 years old now, is Scots language cyberpunk, basically about climate change. And hugely pressing. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, the other one you didn't mention, the international hit for the pretenders. <laughs> yeah, well. I would uh, walk 5,000 miles and I got, you can do it. <laughs> uh, well, whether, whether, the, whether the claimers are actually singing in Scots is debatable. They've got a very strong Scots accent. They do use Scots words, but I think I would walk 5,000 miles, for instance, would be Scotch rather than English. But yeah, 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 there's Ar- Arvin Welsh is obviously the, the prime example of Scots breaking out of its little niche and becoming globally mainstream, you know, train spotting and Welsh's other books set in Edinburgh. Well, I saw a production of Train Spotting in New York and um, the actors were struggling and the audience was struggling even more, but also because <laughs> of the mess. <laughs> With the splashy <laughs> things looking for the pill in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> there Messy are no business. subtitles. <laughs> <Yeah>. No <laughs> subtitles, no closed captioning in the theatre, with live theatre, with all of its pluses and minuses. <laughs> and did people start to tune into it over time, do you think? Well, I, I, I had no problem. I don't have any problems. I mean, I come from Liverpool, we're bilingual anyway. <laughs> Between scouts <laughs> and English. <laughs> um, so, it, one of the other questions is how are books in Scots selling in Scotland compared to English language books? That's another good question. Well, the, the gold standard for Scots language books, and I should say, it, first of all, that the best selling Scots books tend to be translations of existing English books and particularly translations of existing English books for young people. 
So the best selling, the gold standard for Scots books is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, in, or his Sor Sorcerer's Stone, as it would be over there in Scots, which was a proper publishing sensation. On the first level, as a, as a gimmick to a certain extent, people obviously were very entertained at the idea of this incredibly well-known story being rendered and retold in Scots. So there was an element of gimmicky, of gimmickry about it. But when people buy the book for fun in the first instance, or to gift it to a Scots friend, or to have a wee look through it for a laugh and read it, they were finding that they were connecting with it. And so the Scots, there's, it's always going to be difficult. There's 1.5 million people in Scotland who identify as having Scots language ability. Now, how many of them actually have Scots language literacy because it's not taught in Scots schools? How many of them could, by which I mean, how many of them could read and write in Scots? It is a much, much smaller percentage of the population as a whole. It's nowhere near 1.5 million. So you're always going to be limited to that degree. But what we are doing gradually is through translating books for young people, through translating books for adults, um, it's building that audience. And there's a lot of people who, as you've said yourself, Ian, there's a lot of people who perhaps would immediately think that they don't know Scots, would be put off the idea of trying to read a book in Scots, but actually, when they give it a go, find that they do understand Scots, or they understand a lot more Scots than they thought they did. No, it's so very publishing. much um, lateral thinking. So if you see IT translated, I've seen that on inscriptions yeah. on the walls in Edinburgh, and it's just ED. Yeah, but in a different way. Yeah. So it's it once once you've got your mind into that lateral thinking part, it's uh, it, it slips in fairly easily. But yeah. Yeah. one of the keys is suppression. Um, I think one of the cleverest things that London ever did was to tell the Welsh, "You can have your Welsh language. We'll pay for your Welsh language. We'll pay for a Welsh language television. We'll pay for you to have the courts and administration in Welsh," and basically cut Welsh nationalism, militant Welsh nationalism, off at the knees. Because what were they protesting about? They had everything they wanted. You know, okay, mm -hmm. they could wave their flag, they had their own football team and their rugby team. Didn't have a navy. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and of course, we should explain to people who don't know that Welsh is a, like is closer to Scots Gaelic than English. It's mm -hmm. a different language family. Um, yeah. Uh, my name is Williams. I don't speak any Welsh at all, even though it's a Welsh name. <laughs> but my niece, my nephews and nieces uh, live in the middle of Wales and their children were all brought up as, as, as Welsh speakers. Mm -hmm. I haven't suffered any great disability. They got to Oxford and Cambridge. The education system is better in Wales <laughs> than, than, than it is in Liverpool. <laughs> well... The way that the way that the Welsh, the Welsh Assembly and Wales as a nation has brought Welsh back from the brink in many ways is really a roadmap for what has to happen with Scotland. We have lots of speakers. We have a, a literature, which not many, not all languages do. We have lots in common with Welsh. We don't have our act together in the way that the Welsh language lobby and Welsh language activists do and have had for a long time. What's happening in Wales, you're, you're absolutely right, it blunts and maybe defines Welsh nationalism to some extent. But what's happening in Wales is really the direction that we need to go in order to rehabilitate Scots. A few, many years ago now, God, getting so old, not long after I first came to New York, the Foreign Press Association, and we had a, a meeting with the Prince, is he a Prince or a Duke? He's a Prince of Liechtenstein, I think. Um, and he'd set up a foundation which was based on this principle that if you if you tell people they can't do it, they'll want to. <laughs> and this <laughs> meant for the minorities that you want your language, you can have your language. You know, you want autonomy, we'll give you autonomy. And it's the repression that creates the nationalism. It was the fact that the Russians wanted to stamp out Ukrainians and, U and, and Ukraine and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That has meant that there's more Ukrainian speakers now than there were before they started their invasion, probably. Uh, it's similarly in, um, it, in the other languages that once the French were forced by the European Union, by the way, to allow languages like Basque and Breton, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the oomph was gone out of the, uh, out of the causes.
compare with this repression in Spain against the Catalans. Mm -hmm. uh, well, ham-fisted repression. You know, subtle repression is one thing, but ham-fisted repression just gets people's backs up, as it would in Scotland if uh, one of these um, old Etonians from London sent, sent tanks across Hadrian's Wall. It would be fairly catastrophic for Hadrian's Wall and the tanks. <laughs> Yeah, but I think you've hit on something there, Ian, which is that the repression of Scots in Scotland is uh, much more subtle than a ham-fisted affair. Nobody is, it's been a long time since anybody was belted in school for speaking Scots. It's been a long time since any of these direct forms of repression have happened. And so that might encourage us to think that, oh no, we can use Scots as much as we like. But obviously, if you don't have the infrastructure to use Scots, if you can't go into a voting booth and vote in Scots, if you can't write to your member of parliament in Scots, if you can't use Scots in a job interview or when you go and see your doctor, then whether Scots has been stamped down by an old Etonian or not really doesn't matter. In a way, as you're suggesting, it would probably be such to some, some extent better for Scots if the repression was the repression and oppression of Scots was more obvious because people would rankle against it. And the occasional times that Scots does manage to get a wee bit of momentum going, Scots activism does tend to get a wee bit of momentum going, is when someone comes out who shouldn't be volunteering their opinion on Scots and does. On Scots or in Scots? On Scots. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just, just checking, just checking. It's... um. Now, I was looking at this, one of the most famous put downs was Samuel Johnson to his Scottish friend Boswell, who wrote his biography. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at that view behind you, and he said, uh, you know, he was protesting that Scotland has many fine views, Dr. Johnson. And Dr. Johnson said, I, he said, yes, he said, Scotland has many fine, no, many fine prospects, and the noblest prospect of all for any Scotsman is the road to England. I'm afraid that building behind you makes me think of that. Except we've got <laughs> those buildings ourselves there. It's um, and you know, the, like the Irish, the Scots are very good at laughing themselves. They don't take themselves too well, take themselves seriously, but uh, not to the point of seeking slights often. Um, yeah. And what do you think the prospects are? Because there's definitely been a parting of the ways. The the Labour Party, the main opposition party in Britain, has been almost wiped out in Scotland. And one of the key points uh, was that the Scots provided a lot of the brains and passion, whether it was John Smith, who, the Prime Minister who, in waiting, who died, walking on a hill in Scotland, or Robin Cook, the best foreign minister we've had for many years, who also died. Mm -hmm. There's a lot there. Tell Scots politicians not to walk on hills, will you? I'm, I'm drawing a connection here. Because <laughs> uh, they both died. But the, the, they, are, they are people that the British Parliament actually misses a lot. They, they were very significant figures nationally, not just because they were Scots, but, you know, they were accepted. Everyone knew they were Scots. And uh, we have, you know, uh, Tam Daliel introduced what, the Middle Odian question. Why, as I am a Scottish MP, able to vote in Westminster on what happens in Scotland, uh, on, in England, but English MPs can't vote in the Scottish Parliament that was just being set mm -hmm. up. So, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's an easily workable fix here with goodwill all round, but uh, how do you think this is going to reconcile with um, the, is, is the Scottish Parliament going to do its sessions in Scots from now on? I would be surprised. There's no, this S, the Scottish National Party, the current government, have had the political capital to do more for Scots. They haven't yet. I'm hoping this year is going to be the year, and I do have faith, probably a bit more faith than the experience should, should permit me to have. I do have faith that the Scots Language Bill is going to make a difference. Whether we're going to see politicians stand up in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament and speak Scots and open themselves to ridicule, because that is the general law of anybody who uses Scots in public. I should, sorry, I should say to anybody listening who's not aware of the, the societal context here, Scots language is, in the central belt of Scotland is inextricably linked with the idea of, well, A, 
working classness is very much a class issue and also be there is a strong perception in the central belt that because Scots is a sister language of English it is not actually a language of its own right it's simply illiterate English it's slang English so people who use Scots in the central belt do tend to be dung down as we would say in Scots they do tend to be mocked and ridiculed I don't think there's going to be a huge crowd, a huge queue at the Parliament of people wanting that experience. There's not going to be many people in MSPs, members of the Scottish Parliament, who are going to want that to happen to them. What I want to see, and what I think is much more manageable, is signage in Scots at the Scottish Parliament. Documentation in Scots at the Scottish Parliament. Policy documents in Scots at the Scottish Parliament. These things make a difference. These things make Scots visible in a way that we don't necessarily need our politicians to do. We need it to be built into the structure. We don't need a politician who speaks in Scots now and gets voted out. Like your Welsh in Wales. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like Gaelic in Scotland to a large extent. We'll see Gaelic signage. We'll see Gaelic at trains to signage at train stations or on road maps or on road signs. You don't see that in Scots, and that's something that has to change nationally. But the Parliament, obviously, in a lot of ways, as a symbol, broad symbol of Scottishness, I think, is where this has to start. Now, there's a worrying idea of a slippy slope. I mean, I covered the wars in the Balkans, and there was, look, effectively, I'm going to insult a lot of people, there was one language called Serbo-Croat. One group of people wrote it in Cyrillic characters, the other wrote it in Latin characters. And then came the Balkan Wars. And the Bosnian and Bosnian foreign minister, who is a friend of mine, I said, well, what's this about Bosniak? He said, well, it, it's silly. He said, but if they're going to have their language, then we better have it as well. So we had Bosniak, and you have the ridiculous point of um, that, that there are court trials waiting in Croatia and Republika Srpska because they're waiting for a translator mm -hmm. to translate effectively the same, an interpreter to interpret from effectively the same language because they all understand each other. And despite the efforts to invent words to make it different, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's like Noah Webster when he got the, Merriam, the Webster Dictionary of the American Language. It was yeah. a nationalist flurry against imperialist British mm -hmm. uh, they knocked the U's off the honours and they uh, you know a lot of his attempts were gone but uh, I'm sure if the confederacy had won the civil war they'd have uh, made y'all <laughs> second person plural it would be in the dictionaries it would be a matter of honour for uh, any confederate to speak it it's uh, funny you should say that because one of the distinguishing features of Scots as far as English goes, or comparisons to English goes, is that we do have a second person plural which is use. That's our equivalent of y'all in English doesn't have that, and that's one of these little things that linguists constantly point to as a way of differentiating Scots from English. Well, that's in Liverpool as well. What, what do you use? So it is. So it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it's a common trait. <laughs> and um, I was, uh, no, they, because we have the same roots back in the back in the murk of the dark ages. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which, well, it all uh, comes from Northumbrian English, the, yes. and in many ways, what distinguishes Scots from modern English is what it has in common with what it has retained from Northumbrian English. And obviously, you know, in Liverpool and Carlisle and Newcastle, there's loads of features of Northern English which are retained even better protected or preserved even more so in Scots. Like yes. Um, but I see them out. Frank Gomez. This, this might be a commercial secret. How many copies do you anticipate selling? <laughs> um, Dozens or thousands? <laughs> it would be... It would be in the thousands, but not the tens of thousands. Let's put it that way. The, the, a reasonably good well-selling Scots book will sell maybe two, three, four thousand. Uh, Scots book which is selling very well might sell five, six times that. I couldn't give you the numbers for Harry Potter, but it's certainly Harry Potter and Scots has sold a lot more than that, but it's very much at the extremes 
in the general run of things of a Scots book. But then again, it depends on what kind of Scots book it is and it depends on train spotting. I would accept that as a Scots language book has train spotting sold 2,000 copies, probably a bit more than that. Something like Animal Farm in Scots, though, I would expect to sell towards the, the, the single digit thousands rather than the, the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, well, we should get back before we go to the core message of, um, of Animal Farm. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very strong ethical as well as political message he's putting about how people uh people can use the language of liberty and liberation to enslave other people mm -hmm. it's very much like the trump rallies in the south I mean, he uses the language of populism excites the anger you know uh, you mentioned there do you want farmer jones back mm -hmm. was the rallying call uh, so you 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 identify an enemy who might actually be paying you on the side, as uh, as was happening with Napoleon in the in Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, that that's the key message. And apart from the language, it's the use of language in furtherance of that that I think you're dealing with. Comment? Yeah, Bill Orwell obviously despised sloganeering more than virtually anything else that can be done with the language. And to me, sloganeering is just another way of describing cliche. Cliche is artistic sloganeering. When you see it and when you read it in books or when you see it on screen, it's artistic um, sloganeering. And why I think that Scots is important is that we are freeing, or that we are freeing the the book Animal Farm from the cliches which have accumulated around it. Everybody knows 1984 back to front, even if they haven't read the book. And like you say, people talk about it as if it's a textbook rather than a novel. Certainly everybody knows Big Brother, everybody knows the ins and outs of Animal of 1984 and Animal Farm to a certain extent. And I think that can preclude us from actually seeing what is at the heart of both those books. Scott's, I think, gives us a fresh way of looking at the message of Animal Farm, at which, as you say, is a bit mainly about sloganeering and how a big lie repeated often enough becomes the truth. In many ways, it's more harder to why in Scots than it is in English, I would say. You reckon? Oh, I don't know. You haven't met some of the Scots so. I have. <laughs> <But still. laughs> I'm not suggesting the Scots are not naturally more honest or moral than the English. I'm just saying I don't think we have the same felicity for lies in Scots as, as English does. Or rather, we don't hear lies in Scots as often as we hear lies in English. You turn on your TV and particularly if you listen to the Parliament, you're going to hear a lot of lies in English. We're not quite there with Scots yet. Scots as a tool for deceiving people hasn't been developed enough yet. So it hasn't really made the 21st century. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> it hasn't really made the 21st century. <laughs> no, no, and it's all the better for it. Uh, Rereading Animal Farm, and it's a pleasure to reread Animal Farm because there's something new in it every time. Uh, you see its applicability to the People's Republic of China, for example, even mm -hmm. though it was a it was a blink in Mao's eye when Orwell was right when Orwell was dying. Never mind writing, and uh, it, it it comes through that I hadn't really appreciated totally how Animal Farm was sort of in some ways rough notes for 1984. Yeah. He was working out the intellectual and linguistic framework for 1984 with through Animal mm -hmm. Farm. Yeah, absolutely right. And actually, this project started off as me and my publisher talking about translating 1984 into Scots, because obviously the parallels there between you know the, the ero ero erosion and erasure of the language and its and the introduction of this very, very limited language you speak, which gets rid of all the words that you don't want you to be able to use and all the ideas that you don't want to be able to think about. That's it's almost a casebook study of what has happened to Scots over the last few hundred years. But that seemed a bit ambitious to start with. So it was Animal Farm we went with to begin to went in the first instance. And you're right, when you read Animal Farm, you realise that the Orwell's concerns are principally about language in Animal Farm. You might have concerns about fascism, sorry, totalitarianism generally. That's not what he's warning us against, though. He's warning us against 
people who are going to use our language against us. On translator's notes, of course, the animals, the, the anthem was Beasts of England. Did you know feel tempted to change that? I didn't, because I think Animal Farm is a quintessentially English book, both in its style and in its um, setting. So I was, I was tempted, I won't lie, I was tempted, but I didn't think that ultimately it would be, I, th I thought it would be whimsical. Right, and I would have no real basis. I don't didn't think it would add anything to the book to set it putatively in Scotland. It's it's set in England, but you know, obviously it's really set in the Soviet Union and it's really set in China and it's really set everywhere that these things are repeating themselves and happening all over again. Okay, I think um unless somebody's going to pop up with a last minute question, um oh 1984, would it be Ing Sock or Scott Sock? <laughs> I think it'll be Scossock, yeah, probably. <laughs> and uh, that goes. So I think that's, look, that's all we have time for now, I think. I'd like to thank Thomas for coming. And, and I read the book in the Scots. <laughs> nice. And I, before that, I read it in the English. So I've got a comparison, a parallel text in my brain. Um, <laughs> But I didn't need to read the English English to read the Scots English version. <laughs> so it was. Uh, I invite you all. I think we will be putting out the. Uh, we we'll put out the links for the publisher. Um, there's no guarantee it'll get here quickly because, of course, uh, post office is privatized in Britain and being privatized to death in the US. So there's no telling when you send something. They could put the books in a bottle and put it in the ocean and it'll probably get here just as quick. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Thomas. Look forward to seeing more of you. I'll, I'll, I've got to look up Alice in Wonderland as well, because that's one of my other <laughs> things. Thanks so much, Ian, for having me. Okay, thank you all. Uh, thanks. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>